Welcome to the Startup Grind. Tonight we've got Dewoon Kang from Coffee Meets Bagel, and she and her two sisters started the company. We'll get more details on that whole startup process and where they came from. One of their claims to fame is that they went on the TV show Shark Tank and Mark Cuban offered them $30 million US for their company and they turned them down. It's the largest offer that's ever been turned down on Shark Tank. So after that, they raised some funding. They're now expanding internationally. Hong Kong's their first international market. Dewoon used to live here in Hong Kong. She worked here for a few years. So it's a little bit of a homecoming for her. But now we're going to find out a little bit more about her story. But let's give uh, Dewoon a big round of applause to welcome her. All right. Well, it's so good to meet you in person. I got to write a Forbes article about Coffee Meets Bagel a few months ago when you guys entered the space here in Hong Kong. But let's go all the way back to the beginning. How did this company get started? What was the genesis of Coffee Meets Bagel? And what does Coffee Meets Bagel do? What yeah. is it? So quickly on Coffee Meets Bagel, so as I'm sure there are a lot of non-singles here who hope Hopefully, if you're non-singles, have never used the app. <laughs> um, so Coffee Meets Bagel is a dating service that it has become very popular among young professionals in the US. Um, we, like Joshua mentioned, we launched in um, Hong Kong and also Sydney, but primarily it's still in the US. Um, and um, the way the service works is every day at noon, we give you one person. We call it a bagel. It's your match. Um, and in, in, in today's like sort of Tinder age, one person a day seem, may seem very limiting, yeah. but um, it's, it's somebody <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's somebody who is personalized and curated just for you um, by our proprietary algorithm. So hopefully it's someone who is relevant and interesting for you. Um, everyone has 24 hours to either like or pass on this bagel, and if there's a mutual like, you like him or her and they like you back, then we open up a private chat line that you can use for seven days to um, chat and set up a date. So the, the model is very simple. And um, we are often described as anti-tender, or I like to describe ourselves as the best dating service for women, uh, because we are really razor focused on delivering things that we know that are important for women when it comes to online dating. And they are quality versus quantity. Uh, privacy and safety. Actually, safety is number one reason why a lot of women don't use online dating because they feel um, scared about meeting somebody who they don't have any information about. And so we're razor focused on delivering on those values. Um, there is absolutely no searching or browsing on Coffee Meets Bagel. You only get one person a day and you're only shown to another person. There is no spamming. You're not able to talk to somebody unless they, there was a mutual interest. And there are a lot of other features that we put in place to make sure that um, everyone, especially women, feels safe about using our platform. Um, yeah. So who came up with the idea? Was yeah. it all three of you together? Was it one of you? Where did the idea start? Yeah, so I mean, just quickly on my background, I'm originally from Korea. And I, I would say I actually have quite a traditional um, upbringing I, I, I've had. So um, two of my sisters and I, the three of us, actually um, went abroad to the US when we were um, quite small. I was 13 and went to high school and college uh, both in the US and ended up working for Avon, which is one of the Fortune 500 um, cosmetic companies. Um, and in New York City, worked there for a couple of years in their strategy group, then went to business school um, on the West Coast and um, thinking that I wanted to do something in the microfinance space and somehow ended up in uh, at JP Morgan, which is like the exact opposite <laughs> extreme, um, and worked right here in Hong Kong doing some investing work for JP Morgan. Um, then, um, and then, you know, my other sisters also had a, quite a bit of corporate, you know, again, uh, traditional background. The only non-traditional thing that we had going on was that um, our parents are both entrepreneurs. Um, my dad especially has never actually worked for anyone else in his life. He actually started a scrap metal company right out of college with his own brother, so my uncle, so he has a family business also. Um, and we grew up watching him dedicating his entire life into um, building this other baby that he had. And it was just really inspiring to see somebody put so much passion into what they do. Um, and so we always talked about, hey, you know, when we grow up, at some point, let's get together and start something on our own. Never really got around to it until three years ago, my other sister graduated from business school. 
Um, and we were in our late 20s then, and you know, she kind of huddled us and said, hey, we're only getting older, we're not getting younger, um, and once we start a family, we're gonna become more risk averse. I think if we wanna do anything on our own, um, this is a time, it's kind of now or never, it's gonna become too late if we get too old, like older. Um, and so I said, okay, yeah, I think that totally makes sense. And we've had, you know, each of us had different work experience for a couple of years. We felt really confident that we could actually strike on our own. And so we decided to do that, um, but we didn't know what. Um, and the way we kind of landed on dating, you know, I think for any entrepreneurs, um, but especially for consumer brand entrepreneurs, uh, passion is kind of what, what drives us, right? And so we started looking for problems, a real pain point that we could work on, but um, that's something that is exciting for us, uh, for the, the three of us as well. And notice that a lot of our friends were very, very eligible bachelors and bachelorettes were having trouble um, meeting new people. And um, so decided to look into dating markets uh, more and found that one, um, it seems a little bit small. I mean, in, in the US, it's only about $2 billion market um, and it's super competitive. There are no shortage of dating apps or uh, online dating sites out there. Um, but there are three things that we kind of had as a contrarian point of view. Um, one is that there is a huge demographic trend um, shift going on globally, um, including the US. Um, we are becoming perpetual singles, people are getting married later, um, and unfortunately getting divorced um, also. So um, the need for this kind of service is growing globally. Last year actually was the first time in the US history where there were more single adults than married. Um, and this trend is actually happening everywhere. So we kind of see the dating industry exploding. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why you've heard so much about dating um, apps and dating services in the past couple years. Um, the other thing is this lifestyle trend. Um, the millennial generation, which are like all of us here, are becoming so busy and devoting so much um, time into you know, developing our own careers, developing ourselves, and dedicating so much time to us and our friends that we leave very little time to um, meeting new people, right, and dating, and, and um, which is ironic because as we grow older, the need for that becomes greater, um, but we leave very little time for it. And so the, again, the need for services like dating, um, dating apps that actually leverages technology to efficiently help you find somebody is becoming greater. Um, and also there is a global opportunity. Um, the reason why I'm so excited about global expansion is that in the US, like I mentioned, um, this industry is about $2 billion and globally, it's another two billion, which is crazy given that there's only about 80 million singles in the US, single adults, and you know, globally at least like two billion. Um, and so you can kind of imagine the opportunity that lies in, in the global um, you know, markets outside the US. So um, those kind of made us very excited and we kind of first, um, our belief was that dating industry is going to be exploding and growing very quickly in the next few years. Um, and then also when we started looking into the competitive space, we were really surprised at how um, there was an extreme lack of products that we believed um, women felt comfortable using. Um, there is a really, um, you know, most, most of the dating apps out there, I mean, I mean, I think if any of you have used it before, uh, can kind of agree with me in that it's all about kind of serving up as many photos as possible. And um, there is a funny story that I like to share um, when it comes to you know, why is it that, that you know, most of the dating services are kind of designed that way? And I think it's because um, the way women and men date are very different, and most of the dating sites are actually started by men to cater to the way they want to date. Um, there is actually a very, very interesting study that was done by one of the um, very famous professors at HBS, Harvard Business School, who specializes in social network. And he did a study on how um, if, um, how people use Facebook. What kind of activities are popular um, on Facebook? What, what do you think that is? Stocking pictures. pictures, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stocking pictures. But um, what was really interesting is that the way women and men stock, stock pictures are very different. Um, the number one most popular activity on Facebook is men browsing photos of women they don't know. So they're uh, friends of, <laughs> female friends of friends. Um, number two most popular activity on Facebook is men browsing photos of women they know, so they're female friends. Number three is women browsing photos of women they know, so their own female friends. And number four is women browsing photos of women they don't know. They're female friends of friends. 
Um, and so what you notice is that there, there is no one looking at photos of men, right? <laughs> and, um, and to me, that says a lot because I think, um, generally speaking, of course I'm generalizing here, uh, men get a lot of entertainment value um, out of you know, browsing photos of women they don't, they don't know. But the reverse is not necessarily true for a woman. It, it can be quite tiring for a woman to you know, browse countless photos of irrelevant men. Um, and I think that is why we've decided, okay, let's create a brand that is exciting for a woman, that has a very different model, quality of, um, again, quality versus quantity, and that's kind of how we got started. That's really interesting. I'm not sure if I should be offended or uh, <laughs> what. I'm, I'm struggling with that. Maybe that's a good thing, though. Um, so you said that your father was an entrepreneur. Was he positive about you guys becoming entrepreneurs? Did he encourage entrepreneurship? Or was he the kind of parent who said, yeah, I started a business, but you don't want to do this. You go to school. How was he about Yeah, business? you know, my, I have, um, I have to say I, I am extremely grateful and I think um, I am very lucky to have um, a father like um, my dad. When I first told him that you know, I'm gonna quit my JP Morgan job, which was very lucrative and very um, posh, like really, really, you know, I have to say, even though it was a finance job, really, really good like work-life balance. Um, and you know, we're all gonna quit and kind of start this um, together. I mean, it's pretty risky, right? If for all, all your daughters to actually like, you know, dump your, you know, you know well-paying corporate job to start something on his own. And I think of everyone, um, my dad knows how difficult um, an entrepreneur journey can be. But he was super supportive. Um, the, uh, the, basically what he said was, hey, you only got one life. Um, don't make a decision that you're gonna regret later. If you wanna go for it, go for it. If it doesn't work out, I'm here to support. And so um, those words were really encouraging um, because it can be quite, quite scary to make that jump, right? Um, and to have somebody, to feel like you have somebody who has, has your back, um, I, I think is very comforting. Mm -hmm. What about your mother? How did she feel about it, all this? Um, she was very supportive as well, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the three of you, with three sisters, there must be some interesting dynamics on your team there. Who fits into what role or how do you guys work together as sisters? Yeah, so I, I see a Q&A question here, but I'm, I'm guessing we're gonna do Q&A later, right? Yeah, we'll listen yeah. to Q&A later. Okay. Um, so it's, it's quite challenging working with sisters. Uh, as it is, I'm sure, like, if you're working for anyone who you have, who you've known for a very long time in a different context, you bring a lot of history and baggages to the table, right? Um, and um, the way we divided our work, to answer your question, um, it kind of fell in uh, places naturally because thankfully we had different skill sets. So my older sister is a designer. And so she has a very technical skill, so she obviously did all the design work for the product and any kind of marketing materials we needed. Um, that was her, create, being a creative director was her, her job. My other sister, who has a business background, worked as a product manager at Amazon, so she actually took on the product manager role. And um, I took on marketing and biz dev, um, to be honest, as a default, because that was like whatever was left. <laughs> um, and then the two of us, my sister and I, who both have business background, um, they lead the fundraising effort and kind of like all the management, internal work like finance, HR, setting up our value system, um, vision, things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you launch? When we, did you start the business? We launched our service in 2012, April. Mm -hmm. And how many users do you have now? Um, so we don't disclose that number, but as you probably, if you guys have seen Shark Tank, um, I'm sure you guys know we're very, very proprietary when it comes to um, sharing user numbers. But what I can share is that so to date, we've, we've made about 25 million introductions in the U.S. And so that kind of gives you the sense of like the size, size of, of, of our company. Well, let's talk about that Shark Tank episode. So you launched in 2012. When was the Shark Tank experience? Um, so the show was filmed last year, June. June. How did you get on the show and then what was that experience like? Yeah, so you know we actually debated a lot about getting on Shark Tank. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the show, um, most of the companies that get on Shark Tank are kind of mom and pop uh, companies that usually don't have access to good access to capital and it's typically like, oh you know I want to sell 30% of my company for like $30,000. And so um, we were actually approached 
by uh, the studio to um, pitch on Shark Tank, and I think it was a function of a lot of the young producers or associate producers using our app, and they really liked the product. Um, and so we debated, like, are we going to be considered seriously by the Valley investors if we actually get on the show? Um, and at first we said no, like, we are too big, we're, I don't think we're the right size, I don't think we're going to pitch. But then what we found out was that um, there was another classmate of Aram from Harvard Business School um, who actually got on the show and when we spoke to him, he was like, oh my God, you cannot say no to this opportunity because the, the, um, the PR opportunity that you have is like equivalent to like $2 million. Um, and so we actually went back and, and said, okay, actually we want to get on. <laughs> Of course, we actually had to get, uh, go through a very, very long um, uh, judging process. There is an evaluation process that takes place. It is very long. You have to submit like four or five videos that you know, no one gets to see, but internally they use to evaluate if, to, you know, to see if they want to invite you to the studio. Um, and at any point you can get dropped, right? And I think like the level of paperwork that we had to go through was like this thick. And, at one point, we were like, shoot, we made the totally wrong decision to, to, to go into this. Like, we totally regret it. But um, um, we were invited to pitch. This was last year's summer. And um, again, even then, too, they, they actually, you know, as soon as they fly you into the studio, they start by saying, hey, this show comes with three prong no guarantees. One, there's no guarantee that even if you are here, that you're going to see the sharks. Two, there's no guarantee that even if you see the sharks, you're going to air. And three, even if you're told you're going to get aired, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get aired <laughs> until the day you see yourself on TV. And so, again, at any point you could get dropped. We were very lucky. We saw the sharks, and we waited a couple months, and we, were, uh, we aired in January of this year, which actually could not have been a better timing because it was the first show um, of the year. And I think it was one of the highly uh, watched episodes in Shark Tank history. And... January actually is the biggest time for online dating. And so the timing was actually uh, great for us. And you had to keep it secret during that time, yeah. what the results were. Mm -hmm. They're very, very secretive about everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, give us the story then about Mark Cuban. What was the offer that Mark Cuban made to you? Um, so it was funny because as soon as we got on the show, Mark Cuban was like, you guys are gold diggers, <laughs> which, which is a term he uses to... Um, to label people who he thinks it, uh, came on the show just for the PR effect. I mean, he knew that we had good access to capital because we are a Valley company, Valley startup. Um, we've already raised a couple million dollars at that point. Um, and so- and Were you like, hey, you guys invited us here. We didn't. <laughs> um, no, we didn't want to piss him off. <laughs> so he basically was like kind of um, on us from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, it could be quite intimidating, you know, standing on there like four or five, uh, I, I, I forgot exactly how many sharks there, five people kind of staring at you, and you're on national TV, right? You don't want to screw it up, you only get one shot. And they can actually air whatever you say, um, you kind of signed away that waiver, right? Um, and then, uh, but, you know, as we described our service, what we were trying to do, and what, what our fundraising strategy was, he kind of warmed up. He's actually a very, very, I mean, all of them are very, very smart investors. They ask a lot of good questions that makes you think. Um, uh, and, um, you know, when, when he kind of offered the $30 million um, number, we're very flattered because the, the valuation we actually asked for on the show was only about 10 or 11 million. Um, and so to have him kind of, to have such a savvy investor benchmark us at $30 million without, you know, being prompted or anything, um, I, thought, I thought it was a great validation for all the hard work that we've put in, um, the team had put in to building um, the brand so far. Now, he was offering you $30 million for the whole company, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And why did you turn that down? Why not take the money and run? Um, well, so, you know, we started this company because we had a big, big dream, right? Big vision of, you know, kind of overtaking and becoming the next match.com or even bigger um, of the dating industry. And we're just, we're kind of like at a tipping, like the, what's the, what's the term, tip of the iceberg, we're just literally starting off. Um, and so to, I mean, there's no way there's to, we were, we're gonna sell our company at this point. Um, we, there's just so much more work um, that needs to be done. And there I see a really, really enthusiastic hand up here. If, if, if he offered you a higher valuation than what you guys were uh, prepared to, to uh, 
offer. Why don't you uh, counter offer maybe 10 million for 30 percent? You have him on board, and he keeps the same valuation uh, on the table. Uh, yeah, we could have. I um, we were not. It doesn't matter what value we weren't going to sell the company at the end but of the day. But give him give him some piece of the pie, but just keep the same valuation because he obviously tripled your valuation. But he wasn't interested in a smaller piece of the pie. Because um, you were you were looking for five hundred thousand, right? Yeah. So actually, this this part didn't air in the show, but he actually had a conflict of interest, um, so that he couldn't invest in dating company anyway. Oh. Yeah. Uh huh. But you were looking for five hundred thousand, right? Yeah. Uh, as an investment, so Mark offered thirty million, but nobody else offered to take the five hundred thousand. No. Uh, do you think they regret that now? Um, I don't know. <laughs> now, soon after, you did raise funding then. You got your Series A? Yeah, we it? raised $8 million. And who did you raise that from? Um, so our lead investor is DCM Capital, which is a big Series A investor who's um, in the Valley, and they're also very active in Asia. Okay. So $8 million, that's a big deal here in Hong Kong for a company to raise $8 million. We're starting to see those types of funds raised here in Hong Kong just within the last 12 months or so. Tell us a little bit about that process. And was that, did that come about at all in any way because of Shark Tank? Did you get publicity that led to more investors contacting you? Um, so fundraising is, um, like, is kind of like a necessary evil, right, for all funders. Um, it is, uh, I don't think anyone really likes fundraising, but um, you know, it's, more, it's such an important job uh, of a, as a founder to make sure that your company has enough cash to survive the ups and downs. Um, this was actually our third raise because we first did like a very small 600,000, this is all in US dollars, $600,000 seed. And then we actually did another like 2.2 um, in uh, kind of like a bridge. Not, not, so, you know, Series A nowadays in the Valley is like at least like $5 million. So if you're doing two or three million, they, they don't call it Series A. Um, and so, um, you know, some fund, some fundraise, some stage of fundraising were easier than others. For this particular round, Series A, um, this it actually came about fairly naturally because DCM actually um, came into us during the seat, uh, the bridge round, and um, they really really liked the way we were growing. I mean, so they were kind of an like insider already and knew the business really well. And when we said, "Hey, this it's time for us to you know do another Series A," they actually immediately wanted to lead it. So um, the, you know, to answer your question, did Shark Tank help? Not really, because the conversation was already kind of mature at that point. But one of the um, kind of consortium who came later on, it's called Azure Capital, they actually did see us on Shark Tank and um, approached us because they really liked our story and liked us. Great. Did you also see a jump in user acquisition oh, yeah, because of yeah. Shark Tank? Yeah, so if anyone, again, like if, especially for a consumer brand, if you get an opportunity to um, get on Shark, a show, show like Shark Tank, like don't hesitate, it's totally worth it. Um, do you, not only do you get like influx of users at the time you air, the impact actually lasts for a very, very long time because there is such an increased brand awareness of your uh, name that even if you do paid acquisition, um, people actually recognize it better, so they, it converts better. Uh, for us, um, you know, we started doing international expansion in March, and um, so far, I'm just really amazed at how uh, this Shark Tank uh, program, which airs in, um, um, in the US, how well known it is outside the US as well. In Sydney, I mean, they just started Shark Tank there, so they were very, very familiar with the, with the fact that we were on in Hong Kong, so, I mean, the fact that we were talking about it here. Um, and so I think it is a really, really great opportunity for you to PR your, your brand. So if somebody got the opportunity to go on Shark Tank, which is a long shot, but it can be done, mm -hmm. So would you have any top tips for how to yeah. take advantage of that? Yeah. And the top tip, well, to take, not to take advantage of it, but I think... How um, not to mess it up. Yeah, <laughs> or to actually just get on, which is the hardest part, mm -hmm. I think. Um, you have to, at the end of the day, it's a show, right? It's an entertainment. They, they really want to pick somebody who has a great story and a great level of energy. 
like just um, you know smile a lot like even if you feel fake like just be over the top um, the actually for us when we did the video entry video we um, it was so cheesy but we actually uh, um, role played Charlie's angel <laughs> because you're like oh three sisters it's gonna be cute and then so we actually had um, the sharks call us um, on the phone in Charlie's Angel music and then we were like um, we answered and said like oh good morning Charlie all together kind of like the way we said like we're the Kang sisters of San Francisco which is so cheesy um, but you have to do that kind of thing because again at the end of the day it's an entertainment show and they want to provide a good show so now you've uh, you had your first two rounds of funding you've got your series a what are you using that funding for yeah, so there are two main kind of um, use of fund for us. Um, we will, uh, half of it will go into, well actually most of it, into recruiting talents to continue to develop our product. Um, you know, our, our product is great, but there's again, like so much more work that needs to be done. And then um, the, the rest will go into international expansion. So international expansion for a, a company that has essentially a website, a tech tool, it's easy to think, well, what expansion is there? I mean, anybody yeah. can access the website from anywhere. So what goes into the international, international yeah. expansion that you're doing? Right. For companies like ours, which is essentially a social network, you always have this chicken and egg problem, right? So you need uh, like a pool of people um, to be there so you can provide the service, but no one's going to sign up first because like, if there's no one, like, why bother signing up? Um, and so you need kind of a strategy to see the initial um, initial set of people. And so that takes a bit of strategic work. The way we do it is um, now that we have a very sizable existing user base in the US, we always leverage um, our member base and their friend network abroad. And so when it comes to actually choosing which city to launch, we look at a couple of different factors. One, the biggest one is the concentration of young professional singles in that city. And so Hong Kong has a large concentration of that, which made it really great. Um, and the other factor we look at is the number of friends our existing member base have in that city. And uh, when we are ready to launch, we actually send out an email to all our, or push to all our members, and incentivize them by giving them some virtual currency, which we use on our platform. Hey, you know, invite your friends to this launch party and we'll give you beans. And so this like, um, you know, large uh, number of invitation goes out and then people actually start signing up. Um, and then we come in order to um, enlarge, like maximize the number of seating that we can actually have. We have a launch party. I do a lot of PR work, um, you know, a series of media talks um, to kind of buzz up the excitement. And then at that point, um, you want to have at least a couple thousand signups um, before you launch the city because actually the network effect that you have um, varies greatly based on the number of um, the size of the seed like uh, the number of signups you already had when at the time you launch. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be in Hong Kong a bit more? Um, I'm going to be here just for this week. Yeah. yeah. I was actually not able to make it to the launch party um, back in March when we launched here. So I really wanted to come here to talk to some early members to see how things are going and also do a lot of press um, interviews and also, you know, um, talk to uh, the um, the, the, the startup space here because we actually, um, co-working space is actually a great, um, great way to market your service. We started out of a co-working space called WeWork in New York um, back when we first started. And because it's like a, such a large concentration of young people who are very early tech adopters, um, they, everyone kind of signed up for our service right away and we all started getting matches every day at noon and kind of compared, no, <laughs> hey, you know, like, should I like this person or not? It was really a fun way to get the word of mouth going. Now, you're a Valley company. What, uh, should Hong Kong companies try to move to the Valley? Should they stay here? What, uh, is the Valley really everything that it's hyped up to be? Yeah, so I don't really, I'm not quite familiar with the Hong Kong startup scene or the capital scene here, but what I can tell you is that we moved, we made the move from New York to San Francisco and I would, I, I'm like a thousand percent um, glad that we did that. And you know, when we were making that decision, some of our advisors actually said, no, don't go because the Valley is very expensive. And it's true, you know, there is a huge war for talent going on in the Valley. Um, and as developers are expensive. 
But at the same time, um, I, I think it was the right move for two reasons. One, even though there is a war for uh, talents, there is just such a huge supply of developers in the Valley area. Like it's just not comparable. Even if you know people say, oh, New York is like the new. There's a there's a startup alley. I mean, it's just not com comparable because there's like a Google, Facebook, Oracle, I and mean, all these huge tech companies that have so mostly a full of software developers who are always looking to move, always looking for um, exciting startups that they can they can dedicate a piece of their life to. So it's just um, recruiting has been a, f um, a lot easier for us in, in, in the in SF, and that is really critical, right? Like at the end of the day, you really need smart team of um, team members who can actually uh, develop your product. And then the other thing is access to capital is just phenomenal. Um, when I actually did, started our seed, we were still based in New York, and we came out to the Valley and realized like no one knew about our service. Like we were, we we had launched at that point in New York City, and a lot of investor base in New York actually um, started talking to us because they used the service, they heard about it from some someone, and was um, getting excited um, about uh, about the potential. However, when we came out to the Valley, where where which is like where the real, where the real money is. No one knew about us. And I think for a consumer brand, it's very important um, that the investor base are familiar with your, your product. And so you know, we, we thought, hey, you know, we really need to move out here, or at least like, grow you know, our presence here like, a lot stronger in order to tap into the capital that, that is available in the Valley area. So what are some of the challenges you faced starting this business and getting it going? Were there any moments that were scary moments for the business? Were there any big challenges where you had to make a pivot or make yeah. a large decision? Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, there, there were so many. Um, the biggest challenge we had in the very beginning was trying to get Coffee Meets Bevo off the ground without having a tech founder. So the three of us brought different skill sets, but but you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we wanted to be a tech company, but we didn't have a technical co-founder, right? And so we first, um, luckily, my sister's boyfriend at the time, who now is her husband, um, is a software developer, and he helped us a lot as a tech advisor. Um, one, even writing like the job spec, um, because we just, we're just not familiar with the language, so that we could go out there and recruit some people who could actually help us um, get the minimal viable product going. Um, and so he helped us interview. Uh, we actually used Odesk, uh, which I don't know if it's popular here, but it's a platform, a database of all these like, software de developers that you can use to recruit uh, freelancers. Um, so he helped us kind of get us off the ground that way. And, um, but you know, there was no way we could actually check the quality of this person's work, right? And, and, and you know, we, at, at one point, we started working with this de developer from Indonesia who actually disappeared on us for a month. So, you know, having to go through that is like nerve-breaking. Um, and then luckily, by the time we actually decided that, hey, you know, our MVP actually was received really well, I think it's worth, um, you know, dedicating fully, uh, more fully into developing a real product, we were able to, through a really, really, like, a lot of just hustling and manual networking, recruit a CTO uh, who actually on the ground who actually started working with us full time. How key was that CTO hire? That's something that uh, I've looked in for com into for companies too. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really critical. Like I think for again, I don't really know the Hong Kong capital scene, but if you're a consumer tech company, um, to you cannot raise money without a CTO. Like don't even try. Um, and so that's, that's one. And, and um, two is, um, how, well, how many, are you guys mostly technical or business oriented? How many of you are tech people? Got a couple. They'll be, they'll be mobbed after this. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, for one mi common mistake that I see uh, a lot of business oriented kind of uh, founders make is not um, bringing on when you recruit a CTO, um, not giving them enough equity in, in the very beginning to get them really excited and um, onboarded uh, uh, about your company. Um, you, if you're a tech company, really you need to make your uh, CTO like almost a founder. I consider my CTO like a fourth founder. We actually gave him a huge chunk of our company because we really wanted it. it was, we thought it was really, really important that he considers Coffee Meets Bagel 
as if it's some some it's a company that he started and it's really critical that you do that because i see so many um, other startups that didn't do that and then ctos become very uh, disgruntled and resentful a uh, year later because they're putting in so much work and, and yet their equity split is so lopsided and you don't want to end up in that situation like i think at the end of the day um, the like the harmony and uh, uh, you know, the working relationship that you have with your CTO or your par any of your partners is so critical that it really is not worth like arguing over like you know one two three four five percentage of your equity like in the long run. I, I think that is so critical to the success of your business. What are some other lessons learned along the way? Um, yeah, a couple things. I mean, I, there are just so many. Um, I think very early on. Um, one thing, uh, you know, hindsight 2020, like things that I wish I do had done differently. Um, one thing that I highly encourage everyone to do is talk to as many people as possible about your idea um, in a very, very detail oriented way to, to as, as detail oriented as you can get. I see a lot of um, first time entrepreneurs, uh, including myself, we're very nervous about sharing their ideas because they're afraid that somebody's going to copy um, their ideas, and so they're like, "Oh, you know, I, I'm not supposed to share this. I don't want to share this." But um, you know, ideas are cheap. Like you, you think somebody can copy it, but I'm sure if you know a lot of your ideas that you have that you think is really unique, a lot of other people actually have thought about it. The, the real difference um, comes about in execution, right? How you actually go about executing your ideas, and so. Um, I think if you don't talk to as many people as possible, especially people who are experienced um, and has done this before, really, really smart people, um, you might end up, what, what might end up happening is you end up committing and putting so much time into actually trying to execute on something that could be totally off. Um, it, might be, uh, it might not be a real problem. It might not be the real solution to whatever problem that you're trying to solve. By talking to a lot of people in advance, you're gonna save yourself a lot more time and energy and money, frankly. Um, so that's actually one advice that I always share with like an um, entrepreneur who's starting off. Um, if you can get a tech advice, tech, tech co-founder, get it fast. <laughs> I know that's hard, but it is kind of quite challenging to try to get off, get off um, your business off the ground without a tech co-founder. Um, fundraising, so when it comes to fundraising, raise as much as you can. Raise a lot more if you can than you think you need because Every idea when it comes to execution is going to take a lot longer than you think. You're going to make mistakes and you're going to have to start over. Um, and so if you can raise more than you think you need, uh, when you get a term sheet, go out and shop around, create competition. One rookie mistake I made was that I didn't shop around uh, when I got a term sheet um, for my first, uh, first round. It's going to position you for like a great leveraging like negotiation um, uh, place. For you to like have, you can come from place of strength, right? And um, you can increase the size of your your round. Um, so make sure you shop around. Be selective if you can. Also, um, about your investor, I highly encourage everyone to take an investor who has been an entrepreneur before, because they know uh, they've been in your shoes. They know how difficult it is to sometimes um, execute things. They know. Um, uh, because they've been in your shoes, like they're the type of investors who's going to stick with you through ups and downs. You don't. What, what, the last thing you want is um, an investor who's going to harp on you when, whenever you're going through a downturn, which inevitably you will. Um, oh, the last advice I want to share is, um, again, like one rookie mistake that I see a lot of uh, first-time entrepreneurs make is when you first launch. Um, a lot of people fall into this trap of believing that they need like one, two, three, four, five features in order to um, have a successful launch or successful product. Um, really, if you can, stick to one core thing that you think is a real differentiation point for you and, and, and just get that out there as, as soon as possible. Well, the reason why that is so important is because one, when you're first starting off, you just don't have a lot of resources, right? And so um, if you have a lot of features that you need to work on, it's just going to slow you down. And the thing about the, 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 the danger about that is um, for any company, but especially for consumer companies, I think it's really difficult to predict how your consumers are going to react to your product. And so the best thing you can do is to move fast, 
get your product out there and see how the consumers react, get their feedback and incorporate and iterate. Um, that is the best bet to success rather than trying to guess, uh, oh yeah, I think you know, my consumers are gonna like one, two, three, four, five features. Um, and one of the early advice that I got, which I think was really helpful, is that you know, if there are two companies that um, of same caliber, but if company A can iterate 15 times a year versus that company B that iterates 50 times a year, company B is always gonna win. And so it's really critical, rather than trying to getting it, get it right, move it fast. Great. One more question, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So you're a user of the website too, right? How's it worked out for you? It's been great. <laughs> I can, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to create a product that you know, kind of, you kind of believe in, in it yourself. Um, I mean, I honestly have to say it's, it's some wonder to my dating life in San Francisco. It, I mean, I'm so busy with this uh, startup that it's hard for me to meet new people, right? And I'm sure is the case for everyone here. Um, I've, uh, well, I'm, I think I can sum it up by saying that I've met somebody through Coffee Meets Bagel and um, yeah, we're doing great. <laughs> and your sisters have used it too, to some level of success, right? Um, yes and no, but one, one of my sisters has already been married. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, with a guy that she met like long, long time ago, so she's never really used it. And my other sister also, yeah, has been dating a lot through Coffee Meets Bagel. Well, great. Thank you.